All right, well, we have 240 participants on, so let's get started. Ready, Eileen? Yep, I'm ready. Okay, so it's a great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. Eileen White from uh, the Rutgers uh, University and Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Um, Eileen was, or continues to be, a major player in understanding how cellular metabolism and the process of autophagy can influence both tumor cell autonomous and immune control of cancer. Um, Eileen uh, participated in organizing the Cold Spring Harbor Cancer Mechanisms and Models meeting for, I think, three cycles. Is that correct, Eileen? Was it three meetings it back to back? like it was more than that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in the tradition of this meeting that when the, one of the organizers cycles off that they get to present a keynote. And so this uh, provides the background to Eileen's talk today on the metabolic control of cancer immune tolerance. Eileen, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Martin. It's my pleasure uh, to be talking to all of you today. I'm only so enormously disappointed that we can't all be together in person because I think this meeting, uh, you know, a big part of it was the camaraderie and the, you know, the personal interactions amongst the participants. Um, but it is what it is. So I'm going to tell you today what we know about uh, the role of cancer metabolism in controlling uh, uh, the tumor nutrient supply and also controlling the anti-tumor immune response. And uh, let me begin by introducing the process of autophagy, uh, which is an intracellular nutrient scavenging uh, process by which uh, cells recycle uh, intracellular components into uh, metabolic pathways. So the autophagy pathway is illustrated here. Uh, proteins and organelles and protein aggregates and cytoplasm are sequestered in a double, double membrane vesicle called an autophagosome. Uh, this autophagosome and its cargo then fuse with lysosomes where the contents are degraded and uh, the breakdown products are then used to support metabolic pathways. And um, my lab, Alec Kimmelman's lab, and, and a number of other labs have shown that in many cancer uh, uh, cells that this pathway is upregulated and very important for sustaining uh, the metabolism of cancer. In other words, this is a survival mechanism for cancer. And you've already heard uh, from Martin uh, earlier that or for, Mar for Martin's lab, that this is a pathway that's also used um, as a resistance mechanism for cancer therapy. Um, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time today talking to you about uh, the underlying mechanisms. So autophagy uh, recycles intracellular components to sustain metabolism. This is upregulated in cancer, as I've said, um, and normal cells uh, use autophagy to uh, bridge the gap in nutrient supply, uh, particularly during times of starvation. Um, and in fact, if you take a mouse and you switch off autophagy genetically in the mouse, that mouse will be fine for two to three months, uh, but it will uh, uh, be intolerant to fasting and die within 16 hours. Uh, so autophagy is essential for survival during starvation through this recycling mechanism. And we know that, uh, that the, one of the main purposes in cancer cells for this recycling me mechanism is to, stay, is to sustain energy homeostasis and also maintain um, uh, biosynthesis, particularly uh, through supplying building blocks for de novo nucleotide synthesis. And without these activities uh, in a cancer cell, uh, through, uh, supported by autophagy, uh, the cancer cells will die. Um, and now we know a lot more that it's, it's more than the tumor cell autonomous role of autophagy in supporting cancer metabolism. Uh, there's a, a tumor cell non-autonomous function that I'll touch on briefly as well. So this autophagy pathway has an important role in sustaining metabolism, uh, particularly in cancer. Now, the other important role of autophagy is suppressing inflammation. And we know quite a bit about this 
Uh, for example, these cargos that are targeted and degraded by the autophagy pathway are, um, uh, are, are damps and PAMPs. And so when they're not eliminated, that triggers toll-like receptor signal signaling uh, and, uh, and, and type 1 interferon responses uh, that promote inflammation. Uh, moreover, this a lot of the a lot of the machinery involved in toll-like receptor signaling are are is actually are actually substrates for the autophagy pathway. So autophagy also plays a major role in downregulating uh, the the proteins that are involved in activating toll-like receptor signaling. Uh, so the bottom line here is that autophagy plays um, a very important role in, in suppressing inflammatory responses, particularly uh, the type 1 interferon response, and I'll have more to say about that and how it relates to an anti-cancer immune response. So just to summarize uh, the role of autophagy in cancer, bring everyone up to speed, uh, this is one example of many from, uh, from my lab, but other labs have produced similar results in other cancer models where we first ask the question, what happens if you genetically ablate an essential autophagy gene in a, in a, in a spontaneous uh, genetically engineered mouse model for cancer? And here is a KP lung cancer model. You get adenocarcinoma of the lung, uh, but if you, at the same time, you activate uh, RAS and you delete P53, you also delete an essential autophagy gene, you end up with impairment of tumor growth and survival, and a benign uh, uh, tumor phenotype. And so this is uh, just one example of many of the tumor autonomous role for autophagy in supporting tumor growth. We then went to ask, you know, is there a therapeutic window for inhibiting autophagy? In other words, are tumor cells more uh, dependent on autophagy than uh, the normal tissues? And uh, you know that it, how we tested that hypothesis is shown here. Uh, we injured mice to have lung cancer, and then in one cohort, we systemically deleted an essential autophagy gene throughout the entire mouse tumor and normal tissues uh, together. And what we found was pronounced anti-tumor activity upon systemic loss. Um, of autophagy throughout the mouse. And this was interesting for two reasons. One, it demonstrated that there was a therapeutic window. In other words, tumors were more sensitive uh, than uh, most of the normal tissues of the mouse to genetic ablation of autophagy. Uh, but also there was more anti-tumor activity uh, with systemic autophagy ablation than there was with tumor-specific autophagy ablation, and that suggested a role for host autophagy in supporting tumor growth as well. And we tested that hypothesis uh, shown here, where we engineered host mice to have autophagy intact uh, or have a host auto or, or autophagy ablated genetically in the mouse. We then implant uh, the same tumor cells on the mouse, and uh, lo and behold, uh, there were many examples of, of tumor cells that would grow normally on a wild-type mouse and were profoundly defective for growth upon a mouse that had uh, systemic loss of autophagy. And so here, um, so, so in other words, host autophagy does in, uh, in fact uh, facilitate tumor growth. And the next question, what is the mechanism? based on what we know about autophagy, it was either a metabolic mechanism or an immune mechanism. And I'm just going to summarize what we know uh, about the metabolic mechanism. So we uh, spent a lot of time uh, characterizing the metabolic role um, of autophagy in cancer and uh, you know, the, the metabolic role of, a, of cancer and metabolism in general. And you heard Jesse Guo speak about this earlier in the meeting in great detail, uh, but the way we analyze metabolism in vivo is we take a genetically engineered mouse with cancer and we can infuse that mouse uh, with um, heavy isotopes of, of you know, glucose, glutamine, uh, lactate, and, and whatever tracer of choice. And then we can uh, analyze the fate of those uh, 
um, metabolic tracers using mass spectrometry. And when we applied this to uh, either wild type or, gen or, or autophagy efficient host mice, uh, where tumor growth was impaired, uh, what we discovered was that in, in, in normal uh, mice, uh, there's a high level of circulating arginine and arginine is in fact a, an essential tumor nutrient because the vast majority of, of cancers actually turn off the expression of the enzymes necessary for de novo arginine synthesis uh, to divert uh, more aspartate to nucleotide synthesis. Uh, so autophagy in the liver maintains the circulating arginine that's essential for fueling the growth of the tumor. And when we have an autophagy defective host, arginase 1, the main enzyme that degrades arginine in the circulation, degrades, that's what it does. It degrades the circulating arginine uh, when it's released into the liver, and that, uh, that deprives uh, tumors of an essential tumor nutrient and causes uh, a defect in, in tumor growth. And so, you know, this study uh, complements Burke from the Kimmelman lab, I think he, uh, Alec will be speaking uh, shortly, where, uh, where, circul uh, where um, tumor stromal, sorry, stromal cells in the tumor actually supply alanine to the tumor. So there's multiple mechanisms by which uh, uh, host cells, the met metabolism of host cells is actually very important for sustaining um, essential nutrients uh, to support tumor growth. Uh, and we've so far identified arginine and alanine as uh, two important uh, uh, nutrients uh, that support uh, tumor growth. So we then wanted to ask, okay, well, if we understand the metabolic role of autophagy uh, in the host and within the tumor cells themselves, given the role of autophagy in controlling uh, the innate immune response, is this also playing a role in controlling tumor growth? And this problem required, uh, uh, you know, more upfront research to address because the genetically engineered mouse models for cancer that we typically use, as you've heard mentioned by the previous speakers, uh, often don't reflect uh, what happens in human cancer uh, because we use genetic tricks to activate oncogenes and delete tumor suppressor genes, uh, rather than having those tumors undergo a long period of mutagenesis and ac gradually accumulating um, the truncal mutation burden that's normally associated with um, a large number of, of, of adult human cancers. And so um, our genetically engineered mouse model, models for cancer, while they're very powerful, they often lack a common characteristic of adult solid tumors in that they have a very low mutation burden. You can see here uh, melanoma and lung, and lung cancer amongst the many others are um, amongst the uh, human tumors that have the highest uh, tumor mutation burden. And so we felt that what we needed to do to properly address the role of host autophagy in controlling uh, an anti-tumor immune response is we had to uh, develop the proper models uh, with a controllable mutation burden and neoantigen load and response to immune checkpoint blockade and all that uh, uh, to answer uh, that question. And I, I'm sure all of you are familiar with uh, immune checkpoint blockade and how it works. So I won't go into this in detail other than to say that tumors upregulate uh, uh, these checkpoints uh, which uh, suppress an anti-tumor immune response in antibodies that target these uh, checkpoints are revolutionizing cancer treatment uh, and in many cases producing durable if not curative uh, responses. And so the, the remaining clinical challenge we have is to 
make this more widely applicable to as many cancers as we can. And our cancer center um, at the Rutgers Cancer Institute has been contributing to the understanding of how immune checkpoint blockade works uh, by uh, evaluating exceptional responders to immune checkpoint blockade and understanding and, and looking at these exceptional responders and understanding why they're exceptional responders and uh, using that information to inform how to uh, expand uh, the success of uh, immunotherapy to patients whose cancers currently do not respond. And to make a long story short, one of the first page, exceptional responders, a patient uh, with an endometrial cancer where they were treated with immune checkpoint blockade and their tumor was uh, eradicated, uh, uh, turned out when we sequenced this, this patient's tumor to have a proofreading mutation in polymerase epsilon. And uh, what the way, the way this works is that, uh, is that the, you have two DNA polymerases, Paul E and Paul D1, and these are the two uh, replicative DNA polymerases uh, that uh, replicate the leading and la lagging strands uh, uh, during DNA replication. And both of them have uh, a proofreading activity that uh, corrects any mistakes they might make uh, during the process of DNA replication. And if, if a, a human has a proofreading mutation in one of these polymerases, or their tumor has a proofreading mutation in, their, in one of these polymerases, you end it up with a mutator phenotype. And in fact, in addition to the poly e proofreading mutation uh, that this, in this endometrial cancer, uh, this patient, um, uh, patient's tumor had a high, uh, really high tumor mutation burden. And this and similar findings at other cancer centers led to the general consensus that um, a high um, tumor mutation burden can lead to a high neoantigen load and a higher probability of response to immune checkpoint blockade. And we wanted to test that hypothesis and understand uh, uh, the mechanism and use this mechanism for the, you know, to address the following problems. So we need to be able to identify responders to immune checkpoint blockade uh, because these therapies often have very toxic side effects. So in an ideal situation, you would only treat people with immune checkpoint blockade if you were fairly confident you would get a response. And we're, we're not there yet. Um, so a high mutation burden suggests that they might respond, but there are many examples of tumors that have a high tumor mutation burden that don't respond. And also there are examples of tumors that have a, a low mutation burden that do respond. So we really need to understand the determinants of response to immune checkpoint blockade and what role the tumor mutation burden plays in that response. We also have to understand the mechanisms response. We have to uh, best uh, define what are the uh, optimal combinations of treatments uh, with immune checkpoint blockade. Right now, there are 2,000 clinical trials uh, where uh, essentially everything under the sun is being combined with immune checkpoint blockade. I don't know that that's the best approach. Uh, to, to sort this out, but that's what's occurring. And we need to have, and to help uh, address these problems, we need to have mouse models uh, that, uh, you know, where we can readily assess the response or non-response to immune checkpoint blockade. And in the case of a lot of the genetically engineered mouse models that we currently have, uh, they don't respond, and this might be due to the fact that they lack the, the high truncal uh, mutation burden that's found in, in uh, many human cancers. And so to begin to address this and to develop models to, to assess the role of autophagy in controlling an anti 
tumor immune response. We have been developing these models, and this is the beginning of the, the work, not the end. So uh, I'm just going to give you the, the early highlights from this uh, five-year project. Uh, so we developed um, all these, uh, uh, these four different uh, mouse models targeting the proofreading activity of PAUL-D1 and PAUL-E. We have uh, three which are germline mutations uh, similar to or identical to the germline mutations that happen in humans. Uh, and the idea is to uh, test to see whether this um, generates tumors that are responsive to immune checkpoint blockade and also to cross these into the you know, various genetically engineered mouse models so we can have paired isogenic tumors that have a low mutation burden or a high mutation burden in the relevant models where these mutations occur in, in, in human patients. And we also have generated a conditional allele. This is actually the exact allele that was mutated in the endometrial, poly, uh, endometrial cancer poly patient that I mentioned to you uh, earlier. Um, this is, a, is expected to have an ultra mutator phenotype that would be incompatible with a, a germline model. And so, uh, and in fact, this patient, it was a somatic mutation in Paul E. And so we have generated mice to have that exact um, mutation. Uh, so the early uh, work that we've, uh, the early results we have from these models uh, is that, as you might expect, the proofreading mutations in the germline of Paul D1 and Paul E uh, produce an elevated mutation burden and, um, and that also uh, uh, shortens lifespan because these mice get spontaneous tumors, as you might expect. And this is in fact the, the phenotype that happens in humans that have these uh, germline mutations. Uh, but importantly, uh, many of these tumors are, are responsive to uh, a immune checkpoint blockade. Uh, the Paul D1 uh, proofreading mutation in the germline uh, produces, uh, of one of the tumor types it produces are tumors in the tail. And if you follow them over time, they grow, and this is shown by the green arrows. But if you treat these mice with, a immune, uh, with an anti-PD-1 antibody, you can see in the red arrows, there are tumors that are, in fact, regressing. Uh, and interestingly, not all the tumors regress, but many of them regress. And I think that this will be, um, uh, these types of experiments will be, and, and, and models will be very important for understanding the response uh, to immune checkpoint blockade. All right, so let me now return to uh, the role of autophagy in, in, in metabolism and controlling an anti-tumor immune response. I've mentioned before that one of the uh, functions of autophagy is to clear out damaged proteins and organelles and uh, downregulate uh, type 1 uh, TLR and type 1 interferon signaling. Uh, we published on this and so, so of other uh, labs. So we, we, while we were developing the Paul E and the Paul D1 models, we thought, well, we can address an uh, 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 anti-tumor immune response by, by providing um, uh, an, an exogenous antigen, and or, or not, not an exogenous antigen, by introducing an antigen. That's another approach in addition to developing the mutator models that I've described, and you've heard this, this is an approach you've heard uh, described earlier today uh, during the session. And so we've done this a number of different ways. And one of them is to take, to provide a, a tumor antigen that um, by, by growing male tumors on a female mass. And here is a melanoma model. This came from the BRAF B600E, uh, P10 deficient and ARF deficient genetically engineered mouse model for cancer. So this, uh, these tumors will grow, um, but it, uh, if they're male tumors on a male mouse, knocking out T cells has no effect. 
So here what we're doing is growing male tumors on a female mouse. And you can see here when we use an antibody to T cells, now we can get rid of the T cells and improve the growth of those tumors. Okay, so this is a, a visualization of how, uh, you know, supplying an antigen can make uh, T cells recognize a tumor and, um, and reject that tumor and getting rid of the T cells rescues the phenotype. Now, when we grow the tumors on an autophagy deficient host, you can see here, there's a, a great inhibition of tumor growth compared to uh, those tumors growing on a wild type host. And this impairment of tumor growth uh, on an autophagy deficient host is rescued by, by, wipe, by in, a, introducing an antibody to eliminate T cells. And so this was the first experiment where we had some clue that an autophagy deficient host is promoting an anti-tumor T cell response, as long as there's an antigen there that the T cells can recognize. So another approach we took was to, um, instead of you know, growing male tumors on a female mouse, we could take the B, B, BRAF B600E uh, P10 deficient and ARC deficient uh, melanoma cells from the genetically injured mouse model for cancer, and we can raise the mutation burden by exposing these cell lines to, these tumor-derived cell lines to ultraviolet light. And in the case of melanoma, this is the, you know, the authentic mutagen that gives rise to melanoma in humans and uh, produces the elevated uh, mutation burden in melanoma that I showed you on an earlier slide. And so we've done this and we've generated UV derivative, UV mutagenized derivatives of the BRAF um, uh, gem tumor derived cell lines and we've increased the mutation burden and we can see similar results. So here you have tumors growing on a wild type host, you add an antibody to T cells, you improve the growth of those tumors if you have uh, an, uh, these tumors growing on an autophagy deficient host, they don't grow. And you can do a, rescue the growth uh, by eliminating T cells. So again, what autophagy is doing is suppressing an anti-tumor T cell response. Another way, a third way you can do this is by using a carcinogen uh, uh, induced mouse model uh, where you have uh, tumor-derived uh, tumor cell lines. And we've done this here. This is a, a bladder cancer uh, carcinogen-induced model. Um, on a wild-type host, the tumors will grow. You ablate T cells with an antibody. You improve the growth. Growth is substantially impaired when the tumors are grown on an autophagy-deficient host. And you can rescue that phenotype by introducing an antibody to eliminate T cells. So we had three, well, mo more than three, we had many examples where the functional status of autophagy in the host was repressing an anti-tumor immune response. And so now the next question is, what is the mechanism? And for, we turn to uh, analyzing uh, gene expression in tumors that were grown on a wild type host versus those same tumors grown on an autophagy deficient host. And if you look at uh, the immune gene uh, signatures that are shown here, you can see that uh, in all the red uh, in, the, uh, in the tumor growing on an autophagy deficient host indicates massive upregulation of a long list of immune pathways. So it's very clear from looking at the gene expression of the tumors that one of the things that autophagy is doing is suppressing the geno uh, a gene expression signature um, uh, of, a, of a variety of immune pathways. So then we went and we dove deeper into what the, the gene expression signatures might, might mean. And here you have um, a summation of what we found in that one of the key gene expression signatures that distinguished a tumor growing on a wild type host mouse from 
growing on a um, autophagy deficient host mouse was um, uh, the signature of the interferon, type one interferon sting pathway. And this made a lot of sense to us from the data that I showed you earlier. Uh, and that was that uh, autophagy degrades a lot of the, you know, the, the triggers of TOLAC receptor signaling activation and also degrades a lot of the machinery uh, that's required for activation of, of um, innate immune pathways. And so we decided that what we needed to test was, you know, does sting activation uh, mediate tumor rejection on autophagy deficient hosts? In other words, is this activation of uh, interferon, type one interferon signaling uh, responsible for promoting tumor rejection. And so to test that hypothesis, what we did was we crossed um, the autophagy conditional alleles, uh, essential autophagy genes controlled by conditional alleles into a, a sting, a whole body uh, sting knockout uh, mouse. And so in that way, we can generate mice with autophagy intact uh, and um, no sting or autophagy deficient and no sting. And we could then evaluate what happens to the growth of those tumors. And the result, result is shown here. Um, on a wild type host, the tumors will grow. If you knock out sting, it makes no difference. If you have tumors growing on an autophagy deficient host, that they're defective for growth. Uh, but if you if you do this on a, on a genetic background where there's sting deficiency, you completely rescue the growth of the tumors. And so this was very clear evidence that one of the things that autophagy was, did that, what that autophagy was doing was activating the innate immune response uh, through sting in a sting dependent manner. Uh, and then that was contributing to tumor rejection. So one of the other signatures we found, uh, gene, expression, gene expression signatures we found that was elevated in the tumors growing on an autophagy deficient host that were being rejected was gamma interferon. So we decided, okay, well maybe type one interferons are communicated with type two interferons and that's what's mediating uh, this tumor rejection. And so we tested that hypothesis uh, well, first, this is just some of the data, additional data that we had to support that hypothesis. This is a single cell analysis of tumors growing on a, on a wild type host versus tumors growing on an autophagy deficient host. And you can see that uh, the, the red are the, are the number of tumor cells, which are clearly lower in the, when the tumors are grown on autophagy deficient host compared to the wild type host. You can see there are differences in various immune uh, uh, cells um, and an increase in T cells. But if you look at uh, where gamma interferon is being expressed, it's being highly expressed in the T cells growing on the specifically on the autophagy deficient hosts. So not only are there more T cells, but these T cells are now producing gamma interferon, which they were not doing when they were growing on the wild type host. And so we tested the role, the functional role of gamma interferon in this process by generating mice where autophagy was intact or where we can genetically ablate autophagy in the mouse in the background of deficiency in gamma interferon. Okay, so we have autophagy wild type gamma interferon deficient and autophagy deficient, gamma interferon deficient. And then we could look to see what happens to the growth of the tumors. And that result is shown here. Uh, you know, tumors will grow on a wild type host. Here, if you knock out autophagy in the host and the tumors are defective for growth. But if you ablate uh, gamma interferon, then you completely rescue the growth of those tumors. And so, it was very clear to us that what we were doing by, by inhibiting autophagy was we were activating a type one interferon response that was dependent upon sting and that that was then 
uh, promoting uh, gamma interferon by T cells, rescuing T cell exhaustion, and uh, promoting tumor rejection. Now, the final question we wanted to ask was where this was occurring. So we knew from the biology of autophagy in a mouse that one of the organs that's specifically autophagy dependent is the liver. And the liver is you know, a, a very important metabolic, but also an immune organ. And, and the liver uh, is very important in controlling inflammation and is a source of a large number of inflammatory cytokines and so on. And so putting those two pieces together, we decided to test the hypothesis that it was autophagy in the litter, liver of the mouse that was mediating this, um, uh, this, this um, regulation of an, an anti-tumor immune response. And so to test this hypothesis, what we did was we engineered mice uh, to you know, have autophagy intact, uh, you know, with and without gamma interferon, or just where we specifically ablated autophagy in the liver with and without gamma interferon, and then we were able to assess uh, what happened to tumor growth. And the results are shown here. Again, this is a liver-specific loss of autophagy. Here's the control, autophagy is wild type, the tumors grow. Without gamma interferon in the liver, I'm uh, sorry, uh, uh, here the, this, it's a whole body knockout of interferon gamma, um, and uh, the tumors will grow. And here you have liver specific loss of autophagy, you have defective tumor growth, and that defective tumor growth is completely in the, in the caused by loss of autophagy in the liver is specifically rescued by um, loss of gamma interferon. And so to conclude, I think that what we've discovered is a new way to regulate an anti-tumor immune response uh, and let me just walk you through this. We think the, you know, the liver is an important organ for controlling inflammatory cytokine production and their release throughout, throughout the body. And one of the main functions of autophagy is to, to suppress this inflammation and cytokine release in the liver. And what that allows uh, is, you know, to, you fail to activate T cells properly um, there's a failure to get um, robust production of gamma interferon, and that tolerizes tumors uh, and allows them to grow. Uh, in, the, in contrast, if you knock out autophagy in the liver, this produces liver inflammation. You get a, a, a type 1 uh, interferon gene expression signature appearing in the liver. Uh, you get cytokine production uh, from the liver. And in a sting-dependent matter, this activates T cells to produce gamma interferon, and, uh, and then uh, this activates the T cells to uh, eliminate uh, the tumor. And we've turned this hepatic autophagy immune tolerance, or height, and what this suggests is that we may not need to systemically regulate an uh, anti-tumor immune responses. We may be able to control um, uh, response to uh, immune oncology agents uh, or produce an, uh, an, you know, uh, an anti-tumor immune response uh, by modulating autophagy or inflammation uh, directly in the liver. And with that, I'd like to conclude by acknowledging uh, the people in my lab that did this work. Uh, most of this work was done by a very talented postdoctoral fellow in my lab, Laura Play Perez. She had a lot of um, help uh, with, from graduate student Yang Yang uh, and Sherry Hu, uh, Akshata Salant in collaboration with another postdoctoral fellow in the lab, Eduardo Carraro Lopez, are uh, working up the, the Paul E, the Paul D1, and also the Paul G mutator mouse models to study response to immune checkpoint blockade. We've had a lot of help from Jesse Guo, who, who, who talked um, uh, already in the, at this meeting. Uh, looking at uh, cancer metabolism and measuring cancer metabolism in vivo. 
uh, Giesen, Karsley, Uzumbas, uh, and uh, developed a lot of the mouse models that I spoke about. And we've had a lot of help from the bioinformatics and immunology faculty at the Rutgers Cancer Institute, and also especially Josh Rabinowitz at Princeton University for all the cancer metabolism work. And the mouse modeling community, many of which are listed here, have uh, also contributed greatly to helping us develop the, the right uh, genetically engineered mouse models uh, to test the role of uh, metabolism in cancer. And with that, I'd be happy to take a few questions. Thank you. Okay, so Eileen, uh, this is Ben. That was a really nice talk. Can I just uh, ask one question? Have you actually sure. looked at the, the function of the autophagy deficient T cells directly, um, you know, like in adoptive transfer experiments? Yes, that, that's a very great question, and we did that. And the uh, the the during the time we do these experiments, so we knock out autophagy in a mouse, uh, and a, and very shortly thereafter we implant tumors in those mouse melanomas or other tumors, and this immune response is happening uh, shortly after that. Uh, and during that time period where we're doing these experiments, the T cells in those mice are perfectly functional. And in fact, we can immunize those mice that have a systemic loss of autophagy. Now, so, so we're not, uh, that, not that we can, we're not affecting the function of the immune cells that we can measure uh, during the time that we're doing these experiments. However, if you knock out autophagy in T cells and you look you know, six months later, that's a different experiment and autophagy um, has been shown to have a role in, uh, in, in immune cell function in that, in that context, but that's not relevant here. Eileen, there's a question from Marius Wasik. Uh, expression, what's the expression level of checkpoint ligands such as PDL1 on autophagy deficient tumor cells? Yeah, that's a great question. We've been looking at that and we don't currently see a difference with the caveat that a lot of the antibodies to do that are not so great. Uh, but so far that is not, uh, is not responsible. And then um, a certain Dr. Scott Lowe uh, asks, how is the inflammation in the liver produced by disruption of autophagy different from other triggers of liver damage or inflammation such as virus or a high fat diet? That's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, all I can tell you is that if you look at uh, steatosis, I mean, if you look at an autophagy deficient liver, it shows all the classic signs of, of steatosis. Uh, so we, and we don't know what the trigger is, and there, you know, that may be complicated to sort out because, you know, there, when you knock out autophagy and hepatocytes, you know, there are many, many things that are going wrong. Uh, so I think uh, that's something we need to investigate, but I think it's going to take quite a while to get to the bottom of it. One question I have um, is um, black six mice tend to be Th1 polarized and therefore make gamma interferon. Um, uh, so one obvious question is, and this is obviously the perennial question in terms of trying to do models in immunocompetent mice, is to what extent does the genetic background of C57 black 6 influence the gamma interferon effect that you see? And I realize that may be a tough question to answer unless you do the models again in another model, which is more Th2 polarized, but maybe you could comment on that um, particular phenomenon. Yeah, I, uh, we, we have not addressed that. I mean, I, I welcome a suggestion of a the simplest possible experiment to do that would address that, but to redo these types of experiments in another genetic background would be beyond the scope of our publication. <laughs> <laughs> one question I have is if you knock out MHC, uh, if you disrupt MHC class one, for example, by doing a beta two microglobulin knockdown, can you then render that? Can you make this tumor cells then in, invisible to the immune system? So this just rely on MHC class one uh, in the tumor cell. Yes, another great question, and we did that exact experiment, and it does 
uh, make the tumors uh, in, uh, in, uh, invisible to the immune system. So it is dependent on class one. Okay, and then if you elute peptides off those cells, do you have a sense of what it is that is being recognized? Is it a single strong immunodominant epitope or is it multiple um, mutated epitopes? Because presumably from the sequence, you can make some predictions about what peptides might be being presented by MHC class one. Yes, we're, we're doing that now and I, I don't have an answer. I think that, um, it, uh, yeah, we're doing, we're doing that now. Okay. Don't know. And then a purely pragmatic question based on entirely self-interest is, um, are the LSL poly V411E mice now available? Are they published? Um, we, we have not published them yet because we haven't uh, done enough work with them yet. Um, but we're happy to collaborate. Uh, you know, I mean, we want to get all the answers as fast as possible and we ca obviously can't do all the work. So you can, we, we can talk and we can talk about it. Okay, I have 215 witnesses that said that he had used to that. <laughs> Um, questions from the rest of our panelists or, um, or participants. Uh, Debbie Caswell asks, uh, says, fascinating and brilliant talk, Eileen. Have you explored sting activation and apobec mutagenesis? Uh, no, we, uh, we have not. I sense that Karen Vousden is poised to ask a question, but I may be wrong. <laughs> Karen, you're muted. I, I, no, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, if we have no more questions and I don't see any more questions coming from our participants uh, or our panelists, I want to thank Eileen for really a very thought-provoking and stimulating presentation. Um, and I will invite you all to return in just under an hour 